for those of you who are not acquainted with Francine Prose, let me just say that uh, she is the author of many best-selling books of fiction, including A Changed Man and Blue Angel, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, a finalist for the National Book Award. And, uh, and you, ha you have a novel that was adapted for film, and you had a novel that was adapted into a musical. And your latest novel was My New American Life from 2011. And you've been the former president of Penn American Center. And now you will be reading from your latest, your new, new, new love novel. Um, and it's, the title is Lovers at the Chameleon Club, Paris, 1932. And when I read that title, I was so curious uh, as to why 1932. But maybe we'll talk about it. Uh, can you hear me? Well, uh, the, novel, the novel is based on a Brassai photograph, on a very famous Brassai photograph that some of you may know. It's a photo of two women in a bar, and one of the women is dressed in a kind of spangly evening dress, and the other woman is in drag. She's a cross-dresser. She's wearing a tuxedo, and she has a man's haircut, pinky ring. And um, I've known this photo for a long time, as, as many of you may have. And in about 2000, I went to a show at the National Gallery and, the, and saw a little wall text besides the photo. And it said that the woman in the photograph in the tuxedo was a woman named Villette Morris, who had worked during the uh, German occupation of Paris for the Gestapo. So that was all I knew. So I went and looked on the internet. And within seconds, here's what I found out. She was a professional athlete, a French athlete, and a discus thrower, javelin thrower, professional auto racer, and in 1935, the French government took away her license to compete professionally because she was a cross-dresser, which was apparently in violation of the Napoleonic Code for some reason. And, um, and Hitler found out about this and invited her to be his special guest at the 1936 Berlin Olympics. She went, to, yeah. What is right? That's what I said. <laughs> you know, you can't make this stuff up. Um, because even though, you know, as we all know, he persecuted uh, gay men. He seems to have had no idea that gay women existed, but he um, persecuted gay men. He was willing to overcome his distaste for her fashion sense and her identity because he knew that she had a huge network of connections all over France because there were all these regional sports clubs, women's sports clubs, and she knew people all over France, and she was in an ideal position to report back about troop movements, construction projects, movements of material, and so forth. So by the time she got back to France after the Olympics, she was not only spying for the Germans, but she was the person who told the Germans where the Maginot Line ended so that they, they could invade France in June 1940. And then after the invasion, she did, in fact, go to work for the Gestapo as a torturer. And she was assassinated by the resistance, the French resistance, in 1944. So, so that was really the germ of the novel, which I was originally thinking of doing as nonfiction because I thought no one would believe me. It's such a crazy story. <laughs> um, I decided to do it as a novel. And uh, the novel, as it is now, has many different voices. There are five or six major narrators. And the first narrator, the little section I'm going to read since we're doing family sagas, is the voice of the photographer who in the novel is called Gabor, who is based loosely on Brassai. And he's writing letters home to his parents in Hungary, as Brassai did. And um, that's all you need to know. So this is how the novel begins. Paris. May 14th, 1924. Dear parents, last night I visited a club in Montparnasse where the men dress as women and the women as men. Papa would have loved it. And Mama's face would have crinkled in that special smile she has for Papa's passion for everything French. The place is called the Chameleon Club. It's a few steps down from the street. You need a password to get in. The password is Police, open up. <laughs> the customers find it amusing. A bar, a stage, a dance floor, leather banquettes, tables around the edges. A typical Paris nightclub, except for the clientele. But here's the most surprising thing. The owner is Hungarian. She calls herself Yvonne. 
She's tall and blonde and dresses in red and has a weakness for sailors. She sings in that husky voice Papa adores, subdued and choked with tears. When she sang, I heard Papa's phonograph muffled and locked in his study. Yvonne's song was about a woman whose sailor boyfriend has drowned at sea. I'd never heard a sadder song, not even from the gypsies. Yvonne sang with her eyes closed, one hand raking her hair. In her other hand, pressed to her forehead, she held an unlit cigarette. She sang, I will never see him again, never, never again. A mournful arpeggio rippled from the out-of-tune piano while the tenor saxophone looped circles around the voice. The other musicians put down their instruments and sat back watching Yvonne. It's over, she sang, all over. I felt clammy and chilled to the bone, though the club was smoky and hot. I reached for my camera the way as a boy. I used to reach for your hands, but I left it in my room. I was hoping to make a few friends before I asked to take pictures of bankers and diplomats whose wives might not know that their husbands go out dancing in high heels and dresses. Even after a year in Paris, it took some getting used to. The hardest part was not staring, or was I supposed to stare? Photographing these birds of paradise will be a challenge, don't you think? I was trying to communicate with nothing so obvious as a smile, but let's say a smile of the eyes. My admiration for the chic of women in tuxedos escorting women in evening gowns. As if these glorious peacocks cared what a penniless Hungarian artist thought of their fashion choices. Even Papa admits that the French have always had mixed feelings about everyone, anyone who hasn't lived in France since the Neanderthal era. <laughs> Though here in Montparnasse, they like anything <coughs> exotic. So Gabor persuades Yvonne. Um, he asks to take pictures of the, client, of, the, of the Chameleon Club, and she says uh, that the customers don't come to this club to get their pictures taken. Discretion is important. But he, she agrees uh, to take him back to her office just because she's looking eager for a chance to speak Hungarian with anyone. Um, she pointed at a table on which there was a terrarium. Its glass walls were bearded, beaded with moisture. Inside, a miniature garden bloomed, complete with tiny topiary and classical Greek statues. Versailles, I said, what a coincidence. I photographed there last week. Yvonne said, are you blind? Mama, Papa, you know better than anyone what a visual person I am, how I learned my colors before any child in our town, how I could always find the potato bugs in Mama's garden and was the first to spot Papa trudging home after a hard day of teaching. So you will understand how embarrassed I was by how long it took me to see the green chameleon standing perfectly still behind a thimble-sized statue of Cupid shooting his bow and arrow. This is why I have fallen so madly in love with this city, where else could one go to a cross-dresser's nightclub and meet a Hungarian chanteuse who keeps a lizard in the style of Marie Antoinette? Yvonne scooped up the reptile and pressed it to her breast. The quivering chameleon gradually turned the scarlet of her dress. She said, look how little Louis matches my heart. Was this why Yvonne wore red? Was her club named after a lizard? I'd assumed it was a metaphor for her clients changing skins. Yvonne said, Louis is not my first. That was my Darius, the prince, my lizard, killed by a jealous sailor. For Darius, I created a tiny Persian garden. She sighed with what I hoped was grief for her departed pet and not impatience with a fool she wouldn't be bothering with except for the chance to speak Hungarian. She said, one night I was working out front. My friend, a German officer whose, whose name you would know, let himself into my office and put my darling Darius on my paisley shawl. He died exhausted by the strain of turning all those colors. <laughs> Yvonne said, my customers don't come here to get their pictures taken. I understand completely, I said, thank you and good night. <clears throat>